Hey, I'm Ranger Stacey and welcome to the World Science Festival in Brisbane. This is very exciting because tonight is the world premiere of this show which will be happening every night at 6 p.m live right here on these beautiful red bean bags. Now, this is uh, an opportunity for me to pick the brains of some of the experts that are taking part in the World Science Festival Brisbane. Uh, a lot of this, uh, it's a very different year this year, obviously with COVID. So uh, we are, we're coming to you on this YouTube channel um, and it's just about being curious and finding out about the amazing world of science um, from some of the, the experts. We'll be talking to uh, some fascinating people uh, across the next five days of the World Science Festival. So I cannot wait to learn more about uh, the world of science. Uh, now, this it's happening from here. I mentioned the, the bean bags. This is our little set for our YouTube channel. So it's it's pretty basic, but we will not be talking basic stuff. It's going to be amazing. I've got to say these are these bean bags are very comfortable, and I'm going to be welcoming a couple of very important guests uh, tonight, uh, and and really opening our eyes up into the amazing world of science. Now uh, tonight we will be hearing from um, and did I mention it's the world premiere? I think I may have. Tonight we'll be talking to a, a crustacean expert and an animator. So um, this is going to be amazing. But this morning we kicked off bright and early. We actually I went up to the Discovery Center at the Queensland Museum and fed um, a beautiful green python. It was absolutely amazing. Take a look. <laughs> This is Science Live. Now, although we're not on the bean bags, we have stepped inside the Queensland Museum and we're right here in the Discovery Centre. There's so many cool things to see here. Lots of live critters, everything from burrowing cockroaches to leaf insects, but we can't go past this beautiful snake. There are live snakes and it's almost feeding time for this beautiful boy. And speaking of beautiful boys, <laughs> we have Kieran. Kieran. <laughs> That was a not, not such a good segue. <laughs> At least sometimes I'm smiling. Now, Kieran, um, are you a herpetologist or just a snake expert? What do we call you? Uh, well, I, I've, I've got a background in herpetology, but uh -huh. I'm a bit of an all-rounder. So okay. I work here in the Discovery Centre. We need to know a bit about everything. So you're discovering new things every day and a convey... We act here as an interface between the curatorial staff and the collections uh -huh. and the public. So we represent the Queensland Museum collections in a way. So this is a very important place and uh, a place where people, young and old, can come. What is this beautiful snake? So this is a green python. Well, I like to call them blue and yellow pythons. Okay, I can see lots of green, but, but looking... Look underneath. Oh yes, I can see. This is beautiful. So that green is blue and yellow. Uh huh. So these start life bright yellow and at a certain point they start to produce blue pigment and they turn green. They transform into a beautiful mm. snake. Is this an adult snake? Yeah, they're not a big python. Uh -huh. Mate, this snake's probably 1.2 metres long. Yep. Mm. And can you tell if it's a boy or a girl? I know it's hard with reptiles. Well, with these guys it's easy. You just look under their tail. Okay. Because the males have got legs. Well, the females have legs too. But the males have got a long toenail on it. Okay, well, you know, you say leg, but it's more like a little tiny... It's a toenail. Like a toenail. They've got a vestige, of the remains of a pelvis. Okay, it's probably very hard to see that, but it's right there under the tail. Mm. Now, where's the cloaca of this snake? Between the legs. Okay, so right here. Yeah. Okay, so the cloaca is the opening, like for reproduction and mm. stuff like that. What does a male green python use those little legs for, or those toenails for? Well, to titillate a female. He there you tickles go. the girl with them. Amazing. See, we learn about the birds and the bees and the snakes here. <laughs> All right, now yeah. what are some really other interesting features about well, this snake? see the tip of his tail is blue. Yes, it is. When he was a baby, it was brown and he used it as a lure. He wriggled it like a grub to lure skinks in close. So there's a few snakes that do that in Australia. Mm -hmm. Death adders do that as well. Yes, so. that is a, that's a great sort of adaptation mm. or a great way to actually, you know, be able to, to get food. Yeah. Now, the other thing yes. is have a look at his, we'll see if he'll cooperate. Yeah. Have <laughs> He's a look very at wriggly. his head face, face on. Yes. Can you see those things that look like teeth? Just there. The I won't get too close. 
No, he's fine. Yeah, but I can. Yeah, I can see like little pits. Yeah. Yes. Well, they're eyes of a sort. Yes, okay. So they're used for seeing infrared light. Amazing. Yeah. So, so this, is this a special feature of a green python? Of pythons in general. Uh -huh. Not all pythons have them, but infrared light doesn't travel well through liquid. So an eyeball filled with liquid is not much good for seeing infrared light. Exactly. So that's the equipment that, that enables this snake to catch a rat in total darkness. So wow. it can see the rat, it can tell how far away it is, it can tell how big it is, and it can tell the head from the tail. That is so cool. So, wow, the science of snakes, mm. it's amazing. Now, a lot of people think also because pythons, obviously they're constrictors, when they do eat their food, which will be happening very soon, because I think this snake yeah, is looking yeah, a bit hungry, hungry. Yeah. do they actually dislocate their jaw? No, they don't. It's just that the various joints aren't fused as tightly as they are in our skull. Uh -huh. so, this joint here has got a ligament between it that's very elastic, uh -huh. so they can do this. So they can just really open their mouths yeah. you know, really wide, because obviously they, they eat their food whole, so it's a great adaptation as well, once again. Mm. So how do you swallow something bigger than your head without hands? So how do, you, how do the snakes get it down? By opening their mouth really wide. Yeah, but you've still got to get it down the hole. That's true. How that's what we're going to explore when we do the presentation in a minute. Okay, is it something to do with their teeth? Their teeth are part of the picture. Okay, oh, the mystery of snakes. Yeah. There we go. Well, it's amazing to see a snake actually like this eat something so big because, well, how would you equate that to something like this snake, I guess, would eat a, a mouse? How big would a prey item for us be in relation to that? Would it be like us eating a watermelon whole? Well, this snake can catch, kill, swallow, and digest a rat probably 80% of its body weight. Whoa. So I'm 70-ish kilos, so whatever's, what's 80% of that? 50 kilos, let's say? Maths it's like a 50 kilo point. meal. Yeah. No trouble at all. That's crazy. And mm. that's obviously why they don't eat every day like that's we do. Right. We have three meals a day usually, and some people snack a lot as well, but snakes only eat occasionally, don't they? Yeah, look, once every six weeks is plenty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and how long does it take for a snake to digest its food? Okay, so if this snake when this snake eats a rat, we'll see the rat in about 10 days time again. The Out only, the other end. Yeah, the only thing left will be the fur, the fingernails, and the enamel off the teeth. Gee whiz. The bones will be gone. Now, oh, by the way, does this snake have, have, a, um, have a name? Various people here have given this snake a name. Uh -huh. I'm not sure what name is in current use, but it can't hear. So the snake so, doesn't care. Yeah. What the snake does care about is it is feeding time. It's about yep. to happen. Can't wait to see this. Right. Right. Thanks, Stacey. Thank you.
My goodness. That was very, very graphic. Wow. But that is nature. And did you see how quickly the strike was? When, you know, obviously the sensors went into overdrive and that snake sensed that there was that mouse there. It is an amazing uh, phenomenon of nature to see a snake like that actually catch its prey. Obviously, it came quite easily to that uh, beautiful green python today. And uh, I must say the snake did look very satisfied at the end. And I, I think there will be a bit of digestion taking place in the coming days uh, with quite a big lump in, in, the, in the, uh, the stomach as it goes through that very long, beautiful green python. Uh, wow, that was quite an experience. And for people who have never seen something like that close up before, all of the, the adults and the children uh, in the Discovery Centre this morning, uh, I think that would be something that people will remember for a long time to come. And uh, that is just one of the amazing things that is happening across the, the five days of the, uh, the World Science Festival Brisbane. Um, and uh, that's how we kicked, that's how I kicked my day, my day off this morning. So uh, it was really something to behold. Um, also, now there's another great um, place to visit while you're at the Queensland Museum, uh, visiting the festival across the coming days, and that is uh, the Spark Lab. And uh, that is a, a really amazing space where uh, you can uh, check out everything to do with STEM, of course, that is uh, science, technology, um, engineering, and maths. And uh, you can relate um, the you know, things that happen in the everyday world to all of those sp uh, specific subjects. And uh, it's, a, it's great. It's across different zones. It's very hands-on. It's very interactive. And uh, it's a place where today we have a, had a lot of people coming through. Lots of kids really, um, you know, amazed at what they were seeing. And uh, our team actually interviewed Ali today for, for this program. Um, and Ali was at the Science Bar where she performed some live experiments. Let's take a look. Welcome to Science Live. We're here at Queensland Museum in Spark Lab, and this is a place where you get to be a scientist. Now, joining me today is Ali, and she has a curious question, which is, how can we change the way a solid melts? Now, Ali, we're here at the Science Bar, but tell me, what is Spark Lab, and do you need to be a bright spark to work here? Here in Spark Lab, we're passionate about science and we love that you get to be the scientist. So when you come along, you get to test out your own ideas, ask your own questions and make your own observations. And we like to link the science that we're doing to stuff that you might find in the real world as well. Okay, so we're here at the science bar and I can see all these materials mm -hmm. and you said to me before, how can we change the way a solid melts? So what is all of this? Well, we've got some different solids here. We've got some frozen water, we've got some frozen chocolate, oh. some coconut oil, and even some tomato sauce we put in the freezer. And we've got different things we could try. We've got different solids to put them on, so like plastic or metal. We've even got different liquids, so maybe some soda water, some warm water, or even cold water. So what idea do you have? What would you like to test mm. out first? I think I want to test out the chocolate and also mm -hmm. the water ice. And can we put them on these two black trays? Yeah, that's a great hmm. idea. They look the same, but when I picked this one up, it actually sounded something different. Whoa. So I'm not quite certain, but I'd like to test those out. Nice observation. So would you like to get out a chocolate one? I'll so I'm not allowed to eat one. this, right? No, we never okay. eat anything in a science lab. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Do I wait? I don't know. Can you see anything happening? Well, nothing's really happening to the chocolate yet, but oh, hang on. This ice cube is already starting to melt into water mm. on this one here, but nothing's really happening on this one. So I think we might need to wait for some time, but you know what? You've given me lots of ideas because all of this is something I could test out at home. Now, Ali, the festival is on for the rest of the week. Are you mostly working here in Spark Lab or is there something you're hoping to check out? I'm probably going to be here for most of the time that I'm here for the World Science Festival, but I'm really keen to check out what's going on down at the Nucleus. I've heard there's some really fun <laughs> pop-up activities happening there. I'm really keen for that. So thank you, Ellie. Enjoy the rest of the festival. I'm probably just going to sit here and stare at and compare and see what happens with these bits of solid that we're seeing how they melt. Thanks, everyone.
welcome to Science Live on a beanbag, a red beanbag. And sitting on the other end, be red beanbag, is Marissa McNamara. And you are the collections manager, right, for crustaceans here at the Queensland Museum, Marissa. That's right, Stacey. Welcome. Are you comfortable on the beanbag? I'm extremely comfortable. It's pretty cool. Science Live is a really cool idea. And uh, crustaceans, I mean, they haven't got the, the highest profile out of all the animals, but I believe you have a huge collection at the Queensland Museum. That's absolutely right. Um, so crustaceans, uh, first of all, there are a huge uh, diversity of animals that are crustaceans. So it includes things like shrimps, prawns, and lobsters, uh, and also creatures like isopods and amphipods and squat lobsters that people might not have heard of. What defines so, a crustacean? So uh, crustaceans are defined by um, two pairs of antennae, mm -hmm. and they have a special larval stage that's called a nauplius. So it's a, it sounds a bit obscure. Uh, most of the time, they're creatures that we think of as, you know, a, with a hard shell yes. and uh, walking around on the seafloor or something we see on the beach. But uh, there's also terrestrial and freshwater crustaceans and some really uh, bizarre creatures among them. So they're a fantastic group. Random question, but how did you become interested in crustaceans? Well, I worked at the museum for a few years on different projects, but I always really enjoyed uh, doing things with crustacean specimens and I was lucky enough uh, when the senior curator was actually retiring I was yeah, lucky enough to right work with him. Right time. Yes but uh, it's it was such a pleasure to be at the right place at the right time because it's such a fantastic group. That's amazing it is a very diverse group by the sounds of it and there are a lot you've mentioned you've just you know tip of the iceberg. Yep. Do you have a favorite crustacean? I absolutely do Stacey so um, this is gonna seem a bit strange for a favorite creature but um, my favorite crustacean is the giant deep sea isopod. Now, a giant deep sea isopod is too big for me to bring down to the beanbag, uh -huh. so I've got a smaller version of the same thing. And um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that they're my favorite is, uh, first of all, if you imagine something like that, but uh, about Much 40 bigger. centimeters long, they uh, look like giant cockroaches. Uh, so they, they look sort of hideous, but there's, <laughs> there's a beauty to them. So, yes, I can um, see it. I'm, I'm seeing. It, absolutely. So they're um, incredible survivors because they live in the deep sea, these giant isopods, and uh, you never know when you're going to get a meal down in the deep sea. So they have to be very patient and sometimes wait for a long time, and they have a very slow metabolism. Uh -huh. But then uh, if something like a whale dies, uh, they'll have a big feast and there'll be giant isopods all over uh, a whale carcass. Amazing. And uh, one of the cool things, I actually got asked today, because I had the giant isopod down in the Discovery Center, and uh, multiple times I got asked, can they swim? Because this is a marine creature, right? Yes. So I actually wasn't too sure about that. I had to think about it, and I said, oh, I, I think they can swim, but you, they've got all these legs here, so I was trying to actually imagine it. And uh, when I was done with the session, I went upstairs and asked our isopod expert, and he said that, um, yes, they do swim, and they don't even use these legs. What they use is these little um, uh, appendages on the abdomen, these little flaps. Uh -huh. They flap them back and forth, and they use those to swim, and there's an amazing YouTube video of this giant isopod on the sea floor eating a fish head and then it gets disturbed and then it just jets off using these little um, abdominal appendages what that are called pleopods. Fascinating, a fascinating yeah. creatures. So if they, they eat like, you know, a fish head or a decaying whale or that's something. That's right, which is gross. What, <laughs> what eats an isopod? Well, that's a great question. So um, they actually don't have many predators and they think one of the reasons that the giant isopods get so big is because they don't have a lot of predators, so there's so not much survivors. eating them. Yeah, are they, they quite ancient? Yeah, they, the fossil record uh, goes back a long time for isopods. Absolutely. So who knows um, how many, in what ancient oceans uh, the isopods were crawling around in? So here at the museum, you've got that, this huge collection of di you know diverse uh, specimens. How do they, the specimens, come to you? Do you go and collect them, or do people? bring them to you? Yep. Have you got a lot of old specimens? Absolutely. Uh, so first of all, a great question. So yes, we do collect specimens, uh, but also we accept specimens that other people have collected. Um, some of the greatest experiences for a collection manager are to be able to go and, yes. and collect specimens. But, In the field. Um, uh, but because the museum's been around for so long, we have quite a lot of specimens. There's about 50,000 registered mm. crustacean specimens. Amazing. So there's not a lot of call to just, you know, the, a crab you find down at 
uh, Wellington Point, you might uh -huh. not need to add to the collection because you probably have quite a few of those. Yep. Um, but we do still uh, accept specimens all the time. So you work away very busily here at the Queensland Museum. Uh, yeah, and it's great that people do have an interest in crustaceans because, as I mentioned, they're not high profile, but they are terribly important. So while you're here at the World Science Festival uh, Brisbane, what events are you getting involved in? Well, I will be giving a talk on Friday, the lighter side of science, where um, I'm actually going to be talking about crabs. Yes. Uh, it's crazy about crabs. Beautiful. And I love the title. Absolutely. Yep. And anyone who sees the presentation will become crazy about crabs <laughs> as well. Fantastic. So who wouldn't want so that? So it's infectious. And you're doing something else as well? Uh, that I'm also going to be on the floor on Saturday and Sunday in the museum just uh, with some specimens. Wonderful. Happy to answer all of your isopod questions. Lovely. Well, I'm sure the people that are coming will be flocking to see you because, um, yeah, it's your enthusiasm is infectious. Can't wait to see you around over the next few days. And thank you very much for joining us on the Red Bean Bags. Oh, it's my it's pleasure, nice Stacey. <laughs> thank you. I have the coolest job in the world because as animators we get to bring things to life in a way that means so much to so many people. Like Bluey and her family. Hi, I'm Beth Durak. I'm a lead animator at Ludo Studio where we bring Bluey to life. Having a good understanding of the basics of physics is really helpful to me as an animator to bring things realistically to life. The thing about this job that I love is that we get to be a part of the magic that makes something come to life. You know, we get to start with absolutely nothing and then create piece by piece something that never existed before and now you have this living and breathing character. So you might wonder how we create the movement in Bluey. We use cutout animations, so I have a pre-built rig that I can drag around as I need to to create my poses. So if I want Bluey to give us a little wave, I'm going to pull her arm up, go to a new frame, pull her arm down, and I just keep doing that until I have a nice finished animation. Obviously there's a lot more steps to get it to feel nice and smooth, but here we have a little wave. Working as an animator, it is our job to help create a world using acting and storytelling and real world environments to help create a scenario that feels real and authentic. And to do that, we use physics to help really ground our story and make it feel correct. People might not realize this, but animation is actually based around 12 really simple key points. They're known as the 12 principles of animation. We use those to help base our animations in the science of movement and gravity and physics. Let's take a look at the science behind some of these principles in practice. Here we have Bluey. She's going to do a jump for us. Now this might seem like a simple action, but there's actually a lot of things going on to get to this point. But well, that's okay, we can break it down. All we have to do is head back to the fundamentals. Here we have an animated ball. This is one of the very first exercises that animators will do when they're just starting to learn how to handle weight and timing and how to create something that feels like it has a presence in a scene. Using animation, we can create the illusion of weight on mass using different visual cues. So what we've got here our first bounce has got a lot of different heights and it hangs in the air a little bit before it comes back down. To give our second ball the illusion of a heavier mass, I have it stop sooner so it feels a little bit heavier and it stretches less so it feels a bit more solid than our first ball. Here we have our secondary object, the tail, following our main object, the ball. This is how we can get some nice energy and nice movement into our animations. I'll show you this in more detail now. So here we are in cell action. This is the program that we animate Bluey in. We've got all of the key things that we had in our bounce. So this idea of inertia or momentum is seen in the tail where it has to follow through the energy and the energy has to play out to the end of its movement. This is one of seven balloons that I got to animate in our episode, Mum School. Uh, it's a really great example of how we can take that really simple idea of the bouncing ball and put it into context in an episode. 
So in this scene, I had to think about not only how one balloon floats and feels as it moves, but how seven of them move when they're being touched by a character, how they might bounce off each other, when they hang in the air, do they swing, are they heavier in a different point? All of those things I had to think about while doing this one simple scene. <laughs> to make sure that we got the action of the balloon right, we, in our very professional studio, had a lot of balloons that we would stand up, we kick these balloons and just observe them, just look at them and see if we were getting that right feeling from a real world balloon into our animated balloons. So here at Ludo, we work in such an incredible team. There are so many different departments that work together to bring Bluey to life. So we start with script, we go to storyboard, then we go to editing. Then from editing, we start to lay everything out. We have our art design, backgrounds, rigging team, layout, animation, VFX, sound and music. One of the episodes of Bluey that I am most proud of is the episode Mum School. Come on, come on. This way to the pool. Ah, walk straight. Ugh. It's so difficult when they just ignore me. Yes, it is because it takes this really little, deceptively simple exercise that you do when you first start out animation and it blows it up to this really incredible technical stage. But the episode also has this really beautiful heart and really great storytelling. Animation is really important to me because it's a medium that allows for a heightening of storytelling. You can get emotions across in animation that you just can't get across any other way. Like the animated movies I'd watch as a kid, they really spoke to me in a way that was so different from anything else I've really encountered. And to be able to do that for other people is totally out of this world. If you want to become an animator, I'd really suggest following those 12 principles of animation, just embedding those into your system, and then just observe the world. Your best acting moments, your best flourishes will all come through observation. I guess the ultimate question for me as an animator is how can we get to that next level? How much further can we push animation to get that next most beautiful story? Hey everyone, hey, and this is Science Live. Wow, that was a very, very cool job. And that was obviously featuring Beth Durack. And joining me right now on the red bean bags is Beth Durack herself. How are you, Beth? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Now, what an amazing um, job that you have, and we'll talk more of that, about that in a moment. But um, you work in the wonderful world of television, but of course not in front of the camera. You do a lot behind the scenes. Tell me what your job is. So I am a lead animator, so I do the day-to-day -day animating, make characters move, make them act, make them sort of breathe Come and to exist. Life. Exactly. Um, and then I also manage a team of very wonderful animators who help me get an episode out and totally wonderful. Wow, amazing. So as a little girl growing up, were you, um, were you into drawing? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about a little bit about the, you know, leading up to that and how you became an animator. Because yeah. I don't think I've ever met an animator before. <laughs> Where we, we sort of hide away in our little animation room. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I've always been interested in drawing. Like I've always been, you know, quite creative. But um, animation didn't come onto the scene for me until quite late, sort of the end of high school. Um, I'd been focusing on music and doing all this other stuff and then I went, wait a minute, hang on. I love telling stories and I love seeing what you can create out of literally nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I just find that so fascinating and so I just went and did an animation degree and have never ever looked back. And that was here in Brisbane? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at Griffith uh, University. Very yeah. cool. Um, so, and did you have a favorite animation growing up? Did you have a favorite cartoon? Oh, I mean, all of your classic Disneys have got to be on there, oh, you know? Yes. Um, 
definitely like the story doesn't quite hold up but pocahontas is so deliciously animated uh -huh. and then i've also been a big fan of stop motion animation like um the corpse bride and anything by Leica is wonderful now of course bluey has been such a success it is just you know gone through the roof it's just an, an amazing animation and you must be so proud to be part of it but uh, tell us a little bit about the process i mean there's obviously a lot to it but how it does how it does work yeah well it's it's a huge team there's about 50 or 60 of us in the studio working on Bluey at a time and so it is this really incredible melting pot of all of these different disciplines and ideas and people have different flourishes and ways to you know bring Bluey to life so there's you know it's all written by Joe Brum and then it's storyboarded by this incredible team and everyone sort of comes together and builds all of the visual elements together in such an incredible way and then you know only towards the end of the process does it get passed over to us at mm -hmm. animation to sort of tie it all together and yeah bring it to life now tell me about you've, you've been working on something very exciting for the world science festival brisbane yes, yes. and it's at the hatchery and you you know you, you obviously know but people <laughs> at home may know too because it's been happening every year for not your project but the hatchery has been a major part of the world science festival brisbane for a number of years now and it's where the little loggerhead turtles basically hatch before our very eyes but you've brought an, you know a shining light to it tell us about your project yeah it was so much fun so I was approached to help make an AR experience to promote the hatchery AR. AR augmented reality so you hold up your phone and these little baby turtles show up and they swim around and they're very cute and you learn a little bit about their environment how they live what some of the struggles they're facing are and how you can help so I got to design and animate these sweet little turtles it was it was pretty pretty good fun that's yeah. amazing and how long did it take a couple of months I mean we once we were working on it, it sort of just rolled through it, but it's quite a rigorous process to make sure that we were getting a design that was both very cute and very approachable, but still, you know, grounded enough in reality that it that it still fit the tone of the festival. And obviously what you do is very creative, it's very artistic, but, you know, this is science as well, and so you would have had to study these beautiful little turtles as well. Yeah, what a hardship to look at baby oh, turtles tough, all day. Tough. <laughs> well, I thank you very much. I thanks to you, to Marissa, first of all, and to you for coming along and sitting on the red bean bags <laughs> this evening. Um, let's take a look at some of your work thank with you. the animation, The Hatchery. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Science Live on a Bean Bag. Make sure you join us tomorrow night at 6 o'clock on our YouTube channel for the World Science Festival Brisbane. It has been amazing and there is a lot more science and, uh, and excitement to come. Can't wait to see you tomorrow night, 6 p.m. See you then.